everybody, and welcome to Friday Apocryphal Podcast, your one-stop shop for everything Friday Apocryphal and podcast, and boy, do we have a show for you today. Today, we are covering Tobit chapters 12 through 14, and we're finishing Tobit today. Next week, we're getting into the alphabet of Ben Sira. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? I brought that uh, over, actually. Now, this is uh, Stern and Mirsky's translation of uh, a few different texts, uh, and they're all medieval Jewish texts, uh, so they are they are quite late. But you know what? Uh, there's a there's a good amount of stuff in here. Now I don't know if we're gonna cover it all, but we are definitely going to cover the alphabet of Ben Sira because it is just ridiculously entertaining. I mean, if you have not heard of or read any part of the alphabet, it it's just hilarious. You're just gonna love it. Uh, so that's uh, that's what we are going to be starting on next week. Indeed, it is. But this week we're reading the last chapters of Tobit. I've got the Anchor Bible, Tobit, a new translation with introduction and commentary by Carrie A. Moore. I have volume six of the New Interpreter's Bible commentary. And we also have Eerdman's commentary on the Bible. Yeah, we do. Uh, and aside from that, I, I mean, I don't think we'll be using anything. I mean, we have some other uh, commentaries, but nothing that's going to be useful today. Yeah. So last week, Tobit came back home. He got married. He's dealt with the demon Osmodeus already. He solved he, the blindness. Yeah, he cured yeah. the blindness. What is there left to happen in this story? Well, you have to remember, so they, they've had this angel with them the whole time, right? And he's uh, been lying to him about his identity. Absolutely he has. So that is going to end here. It ends today. Mm. No more lying. It's almost like revelations will occur. <laughs> almost. <laughs> well... Uh, anything that you want to say about this section before we get into it? Uh, mostly just some observations on Raphael's role in the book. Uh, so in the book of Tobit, Raphael's role as a symbol of the providence of God is threefold. He has prepared Tobiah for the two healings. Uh, he has guided Tobiah on the way. And he continues to inspire and encourage the spirit of prayer. Uh, but because God heals uh, the meaning of Raphael's name and because the providence of God leaves room for human freedom, Raphael leaves the main action to the human characters throughout the book. He continually fades from sight as they make use of his instructions and preparations. And that is, uh, I would say that's accurate. I'm not sure about that. I mean, if he, you... he stops being like a character after he does what he's supposed to do. He mm -hmm. does his one job. And then it then we concentrate on the other characters. Yeah, but like when you think about the things that occur in the story, uh, you know, they only travel because Raphael is there and guarantees safety during the travel and knows where to go. Raphael is the one who gets the guy married. He's the one who tells him how to get rid of the demon really, really easily. Mm -hmm. He is the one who hands him the cure for blindness. Exactly. And he's the one who gets, like, the money. Right, right, exactly. So the the thing is, it's, uh, like, we're still following the story of uh, Tobiah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are still hearing about, you know, the... You know, how the dude got married and how the girl had this demon exercised, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's all, I, I guess, I guess uh, Raphael is kind of just pushing the story along. He's like, I know what I have to do. This is my mission. Uh, and I mean, this is, you know, it's very on the nose, mm -hmm. but it's, um, I forget what it, they're called in, it, it's, it's exposition, right? Right. He, he is the guy that's just like, okay, next part of the story. Keep going, guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Uh, he, he's kind of like an Obi Wan type character, like a wise. If old you say man. so. All right, well, guys, that's enough. Come on, wrap it up. <laughs> well, you know, with um, the way that the hero's journey works, usually you have like a wise old man who appears momentarily and like gives advice and then disappears. Mm -hmm. uh, Raphael doesn't quite fit that mold, 
but he does kind of serve the same function. Like, he provides all of the detail for what is supposed to occur. You know, maybe he's kind of like a Ugwe, oh. Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. Yeah, because he knows exactly what's going to happen, <laughs> like, all the time. And he pretty much, you know, at the start of the first movie, uh, he, you know, he tells Shifu that, hey, uh, Tai Lung is coming. Uh, and Shifu's like, no, that's not possible. And then he, like, sends off this duck or whatever to to go make sure that uh, Tai Lung doesn't escape from prison. But on the way there like the only reason that he's able to escape from prison is because shifu had sent the dark yes uh yes, what a movie yeah so um <sighs> and the thing is Uwe knew that was going to happen yeah in fact he kind of pushed it along yeah so but presumably Raphael actually has like divine right knowledge. right 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 so Yes, but Uguay is kinetically a spirit guardian. Uh, please watch the rest of the Kung Fu Panda yeah, series. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. That'll be Kung later Fu on. Kung Fu Panda though. 3. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 He OP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can just skip over the TV show, though. Watch that. <laughs> no, no. No. It's nobody. terrible. <laughs> right. Good. Uh, uh, so just uh, some few, a few closing notes here. So thus, it is no surprise that when his, mis- when his mission is over, he ascends to God, and Tobit and Tobiah can no longer see him. Raphael's mission has been successful. They are healed, they have found the way, and they turn in thanksgiving to God. Okay, so there's a little bit of an outline here in the commentary uh, by Carrie A. Moore. Um, I'm just going to read this, because sure. why not? Uh, so in chapter 12, Tobit and his son finally learn what the reader had learned much earlier. Their immediate response to the angel's revelation is quite predictable. They fear him, then they give gratitude. Their final task, says Raphael, is to tell others their story by the spoken and written word. Uh, For the present day reader, the list of axioms starting with do good and evil will not find you, this will occur in verse 7, and going on through uh, verse 10, may seem intrusive and distracting and so better omitted. The narrator, however, was steeped in the wisdom school and evidently believed that no profound axiom could be repeated too frequently. Prior to the discovery of the Tobit fragments at Qumran, scholars could debate whether or not this chapter marked the real end of Tobit, and a portion of it could still be an early edition inasmuch as only verse 1 and 18 through 22 are preserved in all the Qumran texts together. So, there we go. And this uh, this commentary has nothing on the originality of that first verse. All right. So, what I'm getting is that the Qumran texts were actually very, very important for the textual history of Tobit. They're important for the textual history of a lot of books. Right. They are incredibly early. Right. They're very old. Yeah. Strange that Tobit would even make an appearance. Uh, I mean, it is still an old book. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. I wonder about the, um, the canonicity of it. Oh, we talked about that in the first episode. Right. We did. But, um, like there must have been, a lot of discussion around the book. Yeah, generally. yeah. There there was. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people were trying to decide if this was, you know, fiction or if this is or if, the, or if it actually happened. Mm-hmm. That was a a big thing. <laughs> I mean, as far as biblical stories go, it's not super out there. Yeah. Like yeah. if you believe that Genesis was true, there's nothing in Tobit that would Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tobit's uh, really mundane. Yeah. So, let's hop into it then, unless you have something else you want to read. No, no, I got nothing. All right, chapter 12, Raphael reveals who he really is. When the marriage celebration was over, Tobit called his son Tobiah and said to him, My son, see to it that you pay the man who made the trip with you and include a bonus. Father, he replied, how much shall I pay him? It wouldn't hurt at all to give him half of the possessions he brought back with me. He brought me home and uh, safe and sound. So a 50% tip is what he's offering? Yeah. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, holy crap. Uh, He cured my wife. He brought the money back with me, and now he has cured you. 
How much of a bonus should I give him? <laughs> Good question. Could you imagine no. uh, this <laughs> this conversation like in front of you? Like if I were if I were like a delivery driver and I was you know delivering something to a house and they had a conversation about how much they were going to tip me in front of me, I would feel very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. What if you're Mary Poppins? <laughs> And you did all this magical stuff and solved all these problems. How much of a tip should she get if you're the parent? I don't know, but I'd still feel like, awkward. Damn, you should. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a, a couple of notes here that I want to go over. Uh, first of all, half of the possessions. Uh, this is far more generous an offer than that suggested by the New English Bible and the Revised English Bible, i.e. half the money. Although, in defense of those translations, Tobiah and Raphael did arrive earlier than Sarah's entourage, and so could have been carrying quite literally just the money. Most likely, Tobiah's proposal is a vestigial remnant of the Grateful Dead tale, i.e., in the Armenian version, a man contracted with the hero to collect, at the successful conclusion of the venture, one half of all possessions gained. Still, the size of Azariah's bonus attests to Tobiah's generous nature. Uh, Additionally, uh, what I just said, all these things that he listed off, like, you know, curing his wife and everything. Um, So in the Vulgate, this is longer. Uh, Mm. He, it says, he received the money from Gabalus. He caused me to have a wife. He gave joy to her parents. He delivered me from being devoured by the fish. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, more in the, the Grateful Dead thing. So in the tale of the Grateful Dead, a stranger, the ghost of the Grateful Dead man, offers to serve and guide the traveler for half of whatever he may acquire. So in the book of Tobit, uh, half the wealth signifies Tobit's and Tobias' generosity. Uh, so yeah, he's just linking that to the that folk tale background. Right. And this is kind of what... Um I mean, not exactly, but it's kind of what happened with Tobit himself, where he had the money and then it was divided in half and, you know, uh, kept with his friend. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I I mean, the big difference here is that he intends for the other guy to just keep it. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So, Tobit replied, he deserves my son to receive half of all he brought back. So, Tobit called the angel and said to him, For your wages, take half of all you brought back and go in peace. Then Raphael called both of them aside and said to them, Bless God, and in the presence of all the living, acknowledge the good things he has done for you by blessing and singing praise to his name. Honor and declare to all people God's deeds, and do not hesitate to acknowledge him. A king's secret ought to be kept, but... The works of God should be acknowledged and revealed. Acknowledge them with due honor. Do good and evil will not find you. Better prayer with fasting and almsgiving with righteousness than wealth with wickedness. You know, we had one of these kind of uh, praises earlier on that also seemed kind of out of place. Right. Um, So at this point, he's delivering them wisdom. Yeah, yeah. like straight up wisdom literature wisdom. Absolutely. Uh, it is better to give alms than to hoard up gold. That's a formula that you see in a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for almsgiving delivers from death and expiates every sin. Those who give alms will enjoy a full life, but sinners and wrongdoers are their own worst enemies. Now... I will tell you the whole truth and hide nothing from you. So, well, so before we get to the whole truth, I would like to know the whole truth. Mm-hmm. But before we get to that... You can't handle the truth. I think I can handle the truth. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, this is classical regurgitation of wisdom literature from themes that we have seen in wisdom literature. Mm-hmm. There, there are so many uh, references in these books uh let's say so it was wise to be uh careful what you said about the king and betraying a secret of of his uh would be doubly dangerous and there's a reference there to ecclesiastes uh 10 20 
Uh, the idea that the king should be feared along with God is found in Proverbs 24, 21. Uh, and there are plenty of references to Sirach as well. So yeah, giving yeah, alms I delivers one from saw sin. Some of that Sirach in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it, absolutely, it's wisdom literature. So there's a little more on this here to the king's secret, uh, and, and it's important to remember that. Uh, so it it does share a lot of the same bullet points, I should say, as Sirach. Mm-hmm. So that would make sense because these two are written in the same century. Yeah. So on this king's secret, uh, this is a truism not only in Israel, in Ecclesiastes, Judith, and Sirach, but also in Egypt. Egypt, Do not speak of Pharaoh's business while drinking beer. From the wisdom of Ankesh, An- Ankeshanki, 1616, and in Mesopotamia, in chapter 6 of the Proverbs of Ahikar, the sage counsels, when a royal command is given you, execute it at once. The king's tongue is gentle, but it breaks a dragon's ribs. A good container, i.e. servant, keeps a thing within it, but a broken one lets it out, i.e. tells the secret. Uh, Tobit's mention of a king seems somewhat inappropriate or out of context. On the one hand, verse 7a may be a faint echo of the wisdom of Ahikar, just as pour your wine at the grave of the righteous in Tobit 4.17. On the other hand, uh, Lebram, yeah, Lebram, views this allusion to the king as evidence of the tale's origins in the diaspora, Mm. where Jews, e.g. Daniel and Mordecai and Esther, had to serve gentle kings. Gentile Mm -hmm. kings. So that may be something... To it. Interesting. Yeah. I have already said that a king's secret ought to be kept, but the words of God should be gloriously revealed. Now, when you and Sarah prayed, I brought the record of your prayer into the glorious presence of the Lord. So, too, whenever you buried the dead, that day when you did not hesitate to get up and leave your dinner to go bury a corpse, I was sent to test you. At that same time, God also sent me to heal both you and your daughter-in-law, Sarah. I am Raphael, one of the seven angels who stand ready and can enter the glorious presence of the Lord. So these seven angels. Well, yeah, these would be the archangels. Yeah, these would be the archangels. These, uh, this is the first reference in the Bible to the seven archangels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this occurs also in Revelation. And of course, this this is Zechariah. only this is uh, only part of specific canons, mm-hmm. not of all canons. Right. Uh, the term archangels occurs for the first time in First Enoch seventy one eighty nine. Only two others are mentioned by name in the Bible: Gabriel and Michael or Mikael. Writing more than a decade before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Shump or Shump, nineteen thirty three could legitimately question whether the number seven here was to be taken literally or figuratively. As the whole completeness thing? Yeah, Yeah. as a sign of completeness. In First Enoch, the seven archangels, including Raphael, play major roles. We we read, you can go watch those if you uh, are interested uh, in our Enoch coverage. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shout out to Enoch. (laughs) Shout out to Enoch. We get a lot of shout outs to Enoch. We do. Uh, in the angelic liturgy of Qumran, i.e. 4Q Serak Sirot Olat Hasabat, which must, re- must represent the original theology of the sect, there are seven princely angels, seven of the second rank, then seven tongues, and so forth. Most commentators speculate that this concept of a heavenly court with seven angels may be patterned after the Ameza Spenta, the seven high spirits who serve the great god, Ahura Mazda, in the Mm. old Iranian religion. Compare also the court scene in Esther, where the Achaemenian king is served by seven eunuchs and by seven officials who had access to the king and sat first in the kingdom. In this verse, Greek, G1, adds that these angels are holy and that they present the prayers of the holy ones. That all seven angels and not just Raphael present prayers is another indication that G1 is later than G2. In any case, 
Raphael's description of himself and his activities is more specific than that of other angels in the Bible. But Raphael says nothing about his real physical appearance. In the story, he has disguised himself to look like Azariah, who may have been known by some of the people in the story. In any case, the view of the proverbial man in the streets, the effect that the angels were wore long white robes compare, complete with wings and halo, is not the imagery of the Bible. As noted earlier, angels were virtually indistinguishable from mortals. In fact, according to the authors of Jubilees, angels were even circumcised. Yeah. Yeah. That human can't... That, that, that's why humans have to do it. Because the angels did it. Right. And they have a parallel action for every human action. Mm -hmm. Or at least the actions of the Levites and the Aaron. Sure, sure. Uh, that humankind was made in God's image, Genesis 126, would suggest that the ancient Hebrews slash Israelites thought that God and other supernatural beings looked, in essence, like us mortals, and we, like them, uh, had anthropomorphic, not theromorphic, animal-shaped forms. So. so, I mean... There are parts of the Bible that describe how certain heavenly beings look. Yeah, like the seraphim with their six wings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. But the cherubim are not at all. Like right, right, would. right. <laughs> uh, so it gets it gets really kind of crazy, so I wouldn't say I completely agree with that. Um, but that is one interpretation. Uh, so more on this, uh, more on this angel stuff, yeah. because angelology... So he is one of the seven angels of the presence in the Old Testament. Angels or heavenly beings surround the throne of God. Uh, see First Kings twenty two nineteen, Job one six and two one, so, and yeah, Psalm eighty nine, uh, and then yeah, it gets you know references the Book of Revelation and where the angels are in comparison there. Uh, the names of the three, sorry, the names of three of these angels are known to us from the Bible. So Gabriel, Michael. Uh, and Raphael, and that's only in the Book of Tobit. Mm -hmm. um, the apocryphal book first, Enoch, which is you know uh, earlier than this. I well, parts of it there you know it's it's in parts, so you have to like date it by section. There, it's got older parts. Yeah, there are older parts. Some of them are a little bit younger. Um, either way, so it lists the following six names: uh, Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, Michael, Sarakel. And Gabriel, uh, one of the Greek fragments of Enoch discovered at uh, Akmim at the end of the 19th century, adds the name of Remiel. Both Akmim fragments add a final phrase, seven names of archangels. Yeah, so perhaps, uh, well, almost certainly this impacted the angelology of those at Qumran. Absolutely. And I would say that uh, no matter how you look at it, this is an archangel. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Both of them were deeply shaken, and so, stricken with fear, they prostrated themselves. Don't be afraid, he told them. Everything's all right. Bless God forever. It was not any of my doing that I have been with you, but it was the will of God. So bless him every day and praise him with song. Although you were watching me, I did not really eat anything. Rather, what you saw was a vision. Ooh. Uh, interesting. Okay, so a theology of angels is further developed in Raphael's final words. He insists that he is only a messenger. Thanks and praise are uh, due to God, not to him. Mm -hmm. uh, wait, hold on. You, you already got through verse 20, right? Um, ye... I got to the end of verse 19. Okay, get through verse 20. All right, I do want to bring up, though, that uh, him seeing a vision, according to Luke 24, 36 through 43, the resurrected Christ deliberately ate some broiled fish to prove to his disciples that he was not a vision. But apparently here, that doesn't prove anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so here's verse 20. In fact... This is very docetic, what yes. it's getting into. Uh, now, so now... Get up from the ground and give thanks to God. See, I am ascending to him who sent me. Write down everything that has happened to you. Then he ascended. Mm, okay. That, that's verse 20. Uh, 
So he insists that he is only a messenger. Thanks and praise are due to God, not to him. Worship of angels is forbidden in the New Testament, just as worship of the host of heaven was forbidden in the Old Testament. He also describes himself as a spirit, uh, what seemed to them to be uh, evidence of a body. Eating and drinking was only illusion. Uh, the spiritual nature of angels is suggested also in the New Testament. But uh, let me check this reference here. So on it being an illusion, uh, the statement that he ate nothing appears uh, in G2. Uh, uk ephagon uthen. Uh, the Qumran text for Q Tobit uh, says that he drank nothing and... Greek and uh, G1 contains both. Mm. So, so he ate nothing in that he drank nothing. Okay. So there's a couple of interesting notes here. First of all, ascending to him who sent me. The terminology and imagery are reminiscent of those in the fourth gospel, especially John 16, 5. Um, and for ascending, because angels ordinarily disappear or vanish rather than ascend, see Judges 6.21. And if you remember the the whole, um, yeah, where Jacob was wrestling with a, mm-hmm. an angel. Yeah. yeah. Um, Zimmerman preferred he vanished to he ascended, arguing that Tobit's Hebrew translator chose the wrong meaning for the Aramaic slick and he disappeared slash ascended. How could you mess, how could you mess that up? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so while it's certainly possible, Zimmerman's argument is not particularly persuasive. Yeah. Especially it's... since 4Q Tobit has and he ascended. Uh, this is 4Q 200, fragment 6. Um, still, a problem exists. On the one hand, DN yeah, your, Freeman... Your vocalizations are, are on point today. <laughs> yeah, man. It doesn't Way have... to say him. <laughs> Well, it's, I know it it's, doesn't have vowels. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's not even Hebrew. It's oh. it's just the English letters without vowels. Oh yeah, oh, amazing. Well, that's why. Yeah, yeah, that happens. You got to add some vowels in there too. Yeah. And it's uh, you don't really know which ones. So, yeah. uh, so on one hand, D. N. Freeman and uh, Friedman, in private correspondence with the present writer, noted that the same verb, D- David Noel Friedman, by the way, he's a very famous. Uh, biblical scholar. Oh, do we have any of his stuff? No. Oh, we should. Whoop. Maybe. <laughs> um, so he notes that the same verb, all is used in the heavenward ascent of the angel who had announced to Manoah and his wife that Samson would be conceived. There in Judges 13.20, as Friedman rightly points out, all is a hip ill of the same verb as the one in Tobit, and he rightly translates it as and he, i.e. God, raised him up. On the other hand, Fitzmaier concedes that the verb form in Tobit is strange. It seems to be a hip hill form of L-Y with a pronominal suffix used in a reflexive sense. That would be unusual, but it's not without parallel. So either... Uh, Either he ascended or he vanished. Yeah. Okay. One or the other. The Aramaic makes it unclear. Okay. Gotcha. So, and this is the last two verses. They rose to their feet, but they could no longer see him. They kept blessing God and singing his praise, giving thanks to him for all those marvelous deeds of when the angel of God appeared to them. And that's the end of the chapter. You know, that's reminiscent the way he tells them to uh, continually sing praise to God. It's reminiscent of the actual function of the um, the uh, seraphim. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. They're, they're the ones that are doing it. So, yeah. so yeah. maybe we have a little bit of that Jubilees angelology going on here. Yeah, may, well, possibly a little. Yeah. Uh, either way, we can uh, hop into chapter 13 then. All right. If you're enjoying the stream so far, give us a like, share, comment, subscribe. You know, give it to all your friends, family, neighbors, ex-family, ex-friends, ex-neighbors. Yeah, your, your ex-friends really do want to see this. They want you to hit them up just for this. I, I really don't see there being any other possibility. Yeah, you know, why You weren't going to tell them about a word game that you found on Android because Facebook made you post it to them 
do this instead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. Good choices. Mm-hmm. All right. Hopefully that uh, applies to one person specifically. I'm trying. Uh, so how about we hop into chapter 13? Mm-hmm. All right. So after praising God, Tobit addresses the Israelites in Jerusalem. About time, Tobit. Indeed. So what you're about to get into, chapter 13, is the last and longest prayer in this book of prayer. Mm-hmm. It can be considered in two parts. One, Tobit's praise of God's justice and mercy and gratitude for his healing in verses 1 through 8. And 2, Tobit's meditation on the new Jerusalem, verses 9 through 18. So this is repeated in Eerdmans. Um, so why don't you Great. hop into it? Then Tobit composed a joyous prayer and said, Blessed is the God who lives forever and his kingdom. For he scourges, but then has mercy. He casts down to the deepest grave, and he brings up from the great abyss. There is no one who can escape his hand. Israelites, acknowledge him before the nations, for he has scattered you among them. Obviously, diaspora. Yeah. Even there, he has shown you his greatness. Uh, tell me when you get to the end of verse 8. Okay. Therefore, exalt him in the presence of every living being, because he is our Lord, and he is our God. He is our Father, and he is God forever. Though he will scourge you for your iniquities, he will also have mercy on all of you. He will gather you from all the nations among whom you have been scattered. If you will turn to him with all your heart and all your soul, acting honestly toward him, then he will turn to you and will no longer hide his face from you. You know, this is all the stuff that you hear in Psalms. Yeah. In like one condensed form. It's got everything. Concentrate. Yes. Uh, You know, turning his face from you. Uh you know, scourging you for iniquities, but also you have the, you know, contrasted with uh, mercy. And then you have the whole thing about uh, the deepest grave and the great abyss, um, you know, his his power and shoal as well. Mm-hmm. So this is like all that stuff. Uh, and praise him with full voice. Bless the Lord of righteousness and exalt the king of the ages. You know, that is, uh, I'm going to have to, check uh perhaps some commentary there to see if there's anything on that but king of the ages so what verse is that uh that's verse six i think um yeah that's verse six uh so the interesting thing about that uh king of the ages there is one of the titles for god Mm -hmm. is el olam it means god everlasting Mm-hmm. or God of Ages. Um, so this is very similar to that. Yes. I don't, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that this is used as an epithet here. Not likely. Uh, either way. In the land of my exile, I acknowledged him and make known his power and majesty to a sinful nation. You sinners, turn and do what is right before him. Perhaps he may look with favor upon you and show you mercy. I will exalt my God, and I will rejoice in the king of heaven. Let all men speak of his majesty and acknowledge him in Jerusalem. And that is the end of verse 8. Okay, so there's quite a bit here. Also, verse 8 was a single line. (laughs) And acknowledge him in Jerusalem. Yeah. So, verses 7 through 10a are missing from the Sinaiticus manuscript, and most modern commentators resort to the Old Latin as well as to the Greek text in Vaticanus. Elsewhere in the chapter, Vaticanus is usually fairly close to the text of the Sinaiticus. However, we are fortunate that now a good portion of this chapter is available in the Hebrew and Aramaic fragments from Qumran. There are many small variants, even from the Sinaiticus text, 
showing that the Greek tradition does not reflect the original in all details in this chapter. However, the sense is usually the same, even if there are small differences. Here in verse 1 through 8, we have mixed in with praise of God, references to the scattered nature of Israel. This scattering was done as a punishment for sin, and God will soon show mercy. All that has to be done to, uh, is to turn to God with a whole new heart. This theme then carries on to the next section on the New Jerusalem. But um, there's this, uh, they bring up joy, and this uh, concept of joy occurs frequently in the book of Tobit. He complains that because of his affliction, he has no joy in 510. Uh, God brings joy to Raguel and Sarah by means of Tobiah 8.16. Uh, joy returns to Tobit 11.15-16. through 16, And all the Jews of Nineveh through God's mercy 11.17-18. The prayers are particularly filled with expressions of joy, Raguel's and Tobit's. So also, he does bless God here, th- so, therefore making good on what uh, Raphael requested of him Prior. Absolutely. And before you uh, continue, so you know how you mentioned this was uh, omitted from Sinaiticus? Uh, just the last uh, 7 through 10. Right, eight. right, right. Yeah. Just those parts. So interestingly, uh, after copying this phrase, uh, the eye of the copyist of Codex Sinaiticus skipped from here to the identical phrase, and here being uh, King of Ages. Um, to the identical phrase in verse 10b, thereby omitting all of verses 7 through 10a, through, uh, oh, okay. So this is th- that's the type of um, mistake. Uh, so here, as in all modern translations, the text for verses seven through ten a is based upon uh, Greek one and two and the old Latin. Although four Q Tobit preserves a very small portion of verses six through ten. Yeah. So this is like just scribal error, not an intentional yeah. r- removal of information for theological purposes. Mm -hmm. Um, So these verses comprise the prayer of an individual who has been delivered from the deepest distress and affliction. The prayer is couched, however, in general terms and phrases that draw from the wealth of biblical prayers. Thus, like the prayers of... I'd say so. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Like the prayers of Hannah and Jonah, 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10, and Jonah 2, 30 through 10... uh, Oh, that's probably an error. 230 through 10. Uh, I'm going to assume yeah, that I would means assume that's an error. 2, 3 through 10. Yeah, I would uh, guess. Makes more sense. Yeah. It becomes a prayer of thanksgiving for all who are delivered from distress. In this way, Tobit himself becomes a model for his people Israel. He can bear witness that the God who chastises also shows mercy, that the one who leads down to the darkness of Sheol also leads out into the light. He can also assert that the God who has scattered the people will again gather them. For this reason, Tobit calls his kindred to return to God and join in his praise. The prayer has elements of both the Psalms of Thanksgiving and the hymns, as in songs of Thanksgiving, the memory of Tobit's own affliction and deliverance is very near. He expresses his intention to give thanks and to praise God. However, no detailed description of his distress appears. The general phrases concerning God's deliverance resemble the hymn, as do the repeated calls to give praise and the list of reasons for praise. Just as the story of Tobit's life exhibits the basic principles of Deuteronomic theology in narrative form, so also this prayer exemplifies much of Deuteronomic theology theology in the language of prayer the concept of joy permeates deuteronomy e.g deuteronomy 12 7 14 26 16 11 as so the theory of retribution is a deuteronomic concept deuteronomy 28 uh, uh, if the people obey god they'll have long life in the land if they disobey they won't uh, the living god gives people a choice between life and death Deuteronomy exhorts the people to turn back to God with their whole heart and soul. In Deuteronomy, Israel is required to worship God in the place that the Lord chooses, that is Jerusalem. In his youth, Tobit was faithful to the cult in Jerusalem. Now confident of a return from exile, he exhorts his people to praise God again in Jerusalem. 
Weitzman uses the allusion in Tobit 13 to Deuteronomy 32. To, um, so to link De- Tobit 12 through 13 with Deuteronomy 31 through 32. Which we're not at 12 through 13 yet. Right. Well, we're... Did you want to save it for when we get there? No. I'm, I'm not talking about the verses. I'm talking about the chapters. Oh, okay. Um, the farewell speech and the song of Moses are what it's reminiscent of. Mm. Uh, he concludes that the biblical allusions in the book of Tobit move from the beginning of the Pentateuch, the betrothal scenes from Genesis, the similarity between Raguel and Abraham, uh, the Joseph story, to its end, Deuteronomy. He also notes that the allusions all come from scenes that take place outside the land of Israel. The farewell speech and the song of Moses occur just before the people's entrance into the land. Thus, the biblical allusion to the whole Pentateuch reinforces the content of Tobit's life story and his song. Tobit's life is lived according to the Torah from beginning to end. His song promises that the banishment from the land of Israel will soon end. About time. Yes. Jerusalem, holy city, he will scourge you for what your children have done, but he will again have mercy on the children of the righteous. Acknowledge the Lord as he deserves and bless the king of the ages so that your sanctuary will be rebuilt in you again with joy. May he cheer all those within you who were exiles and love for all generations, those within you who were distressed. A bright light will shine to all the ends of the earth. Many nations will come to you from far away, the inhabitants of the remotest parts of the earth, to be your, or sorry, to your holy name bearing in their hands their gifts for the king of heaven. Now, this is um, something that's uh, a little bit different. Well, it seems very exile-y. Well, yeah, absolutely. But I'm saying that they are... Okay, so we've had plenty of illusions, I think, uh, even in Jeremiah, right? Where mm-hmm. uh People are going to bow down to God. Uh, But we've also had plenty of allusions to that not being an okay thing, that this is the God of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Uh, And other people won't be the ones, uh, you know, people of the nations, right? The enemies. Mm -hmm. Uh, They will not be worshiping him because they won't be around for that. Um. What verse did you finish at? Oh, uh, that was give their gifts to the king of heaven, generation after generation. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done with verse 11. Okay, I have... I'll finish verse 11. I have commentary at once you finish verse 14. Okay. Bearing in their hands their gifts for the king of heaven, generation after generation will give joyful praise in you, and it will be a great name forever. Cursed are all who speak harshly against you. Cursed are all who destroy you and pull down your walls. All who demolish your towers and set fire to your homes. But blessed forever will be all who revere you. You said verse 12, right? Verse 14. Gotcha. I'll continue. Then rejoice and exult over the children of the righteous who will all be gathered together and will bless the Lord of the ages. Happy are those who love you and happy will be those who rejoice in your prosperity. Happy also are all men who grieve over your affliction for they will rejoice with you and witness all your joy forever. So, and that is, uh, yeah, that's the end of the verse. So a few things here. The emphasis in Tobit has been the captivity and exile of Israel, which had taken place in 722 BC with the fall of Samaria. Yet it's clearly the Jewish captivity, which is the real concern, as already pointed out. Uh, from the perspective of the story, the fall of Jerusalem was still almost a century in the future. Tobit's prayer is in the nature of a... Vaticinia ex eventu, though I yeah, guess if that's, if that's Latin, then it would be 
Watisinia X Eventu, right? I have no idea. <laughs> a prophecy after the event, a pseudo prophecy, which was actually written yeah. uh, after the events. It pretends to foretell. It's not presented yeah. as a prophecy. Here. It's antedated. Yeah. Um, so there's some notes on this curse stuff here. The second unit begins with curses and ends with beatitudes. Uh, beatitudes. 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 The list of curses varies in the textual witnesses. The Qumran text for Q Tobit and the Old Latin offer the fullest text. Cursed be all who despise you and revile you. Cursed be all who hate you and speak a harsh word against you. Cursed be all who destroy you and pull down your walls. Anyone who's destroyed Jerusalem in the past or who does so in the future comes under the curse. Cursing does not dominate the union, however, uh, blessing does. Um, they're anticipated in verse 12 with a blessing on those who stand in awe of Jerusalem. In G2, the same term used for fear of the Lord is applied here to God's city. In G1, the blessing is for those who love the city. The city is then called to rejoice over the people who will be gathered again within it to bless God. God's again uh, named Lord of the Ages. There's been plenty of references in this chapter so far to that title. Yeah. Um, I think I counted three. Yeah. Uh. So there's a balance between blessings and curses, and the theme of joy recurs. Along with the threefold exclamation, happy are X. Uh, is three mo- threefold statement of joy. Those who rejoice in Jerusalem's peace and those who once grieved over its afflictions now will rejoice and behold Jerusalem's joy forever. You know, something I noticed uh, about this, uh, this song of praise that we've went over so far. So the first part of it wasn't very uh, original at all. No. This one that we just read through is a little more original, I would say, you know, language-wise. Like, while we've seen the themes pop up other places, this is written in just a different way. Um, So there are actually a few different ways that this this psalm, I'll call it that, has been described. Um, So some scholars say that it is not merely a uh, pastiche of biblical quotations, but a unique an artistic creation and it ranges from that to uh, the piece is without originality or sparkle and uh, <laughs> those are the two extremes no more sparkling yes yeah. uh, something more than mere canto of scripture text is not very uh, appositely strung together uh, Tobit's psalm is a fine composition it is superior to all the other prayers in the book wow. as to style uh, though it suffers in places from the excessive fullness of other parts of the book. Uh, so, yeah, those are, you know, some of the the opinions there. And, you know, people are trying to decide when that section was written because it does seem off. Uh, now, just from a cursory reading of that, uh, because I don't know all the manuscript evidence, be- mm-hmm. because I don't... Uh, I don't know everything there is to know about Tobit, right? How uh, but, dare you, sir? Oh, but God, I'm sorry. Uh, what are you, not a Tobit scholar? No, I'm, oh, I, I apologize. <laughs> so just from that reading of it, I think that the first part of it, uh, so I guess 13.3 through 13.8 has a different author than 13.9 through uh, 13, 14, as I've read so far. I, I, my opinion on, you know, mm-hmm. when those um, when those markers are. They are definitely different prayers. Yeah, well, yeah, they, they are different prayers. And because this, uh, the first one is very copy-pasty mm-hmm. from other psalms. Uh, Almost like that one psalm that's that like, once, yeah. let's have a new psalm. And, and then it's <laughs> just copied and pasted yes. from other psalms. Yes, almost like that. I forget which one it was, but almost it's like, like that one. It's like 40-something. I, I don't remember. And I remember it being like t- 12 other it, psalms. It was, it was quite bad. Yeah, lots of it was just references to other psalms. It was not 
an original composition at all. No. So uh, in the same way, I feel like that first part would would be part of it. But again, I don't know all the manuscript evidence. This is just from reading it. That's just the feeling I'm getting off of it. Uh, but conti- to continue on here. My soul, praise the Lord, the great king. For Jerusalem will be rebuilt as his house for all ages. What bliss if the remnant of my descendants should witness your splendor and acknowledge the king of heaven. The gates of Jerusalem will be built of sapphire and emerald and all your walls of costly stone. The towers of Jerusalem will be built of gold and their battlements of the finest gold. So this is the like the streets a... of Jerusalem will be paved with rubies and stones of Ophir and the gates of Jerusalem will sing hymns of joy and all her houses will cry hallelujah. Blessed be the God of Israel, and the blessed will be his holy name forever and ever. So, first of all, obviously, it's very fancy. Very fancy. But the uh, towers of gold and all the gems and stuff, it seems to call back to the description of the building of the first temple. Uh, Yes. Which would... Very, also very lavish. Which would also almost certainly... Be of concern to the Jews in exile. Yeah. yeah. Um. So on this section here, the prayer ends with the building of an idealized Jerusalem made of precious stones and pure gold. Such an eschatological city is perhaps best known from Revelations 21, 10 through 21. Though we have other passages of idealized Zion in the prophetic literature. Isaiah 2, 2 through 4. Uh, Micah 4, 1 through 5. Isaiah 54, 11 through 14. Ezekiel 40 through 48. Does this mean that Tobit is perhaps anticipating the rebuilding of Jerusalem in a way which never took place? Is this then a genuine prophecy with mythical elements which were never fulfilled? Yeah, they got to do space mining for all that gold first. Mm. And, you know, those gems, they got to be grown in space because, we, they, they, you know, we don't have the properties on Earth to do that. They're but so big for those yeah. roads. They certainly have enough to do it if they already did it once. So, um, So, although such an explanation is always possible, it seems more likely that the author knew of an actual uh, rebuilding of the city and the temple, but uses it as an anticipation of an eschatological building still in his own future. This interpretation is given support by the content of the next chapter, especially verse 5 in the next chapter. Wouldn't also considering uh, Ezra and Nehemiah work there? Mm-hmm. There was a lot that was, um, I it, mean, it, it, it was it all about building. Yeah, it wasn't rebuilding. like, you know, super amazing. It wasn't like described in those kinds of terms, I don't think. But uh, yeah, you are talking about a rebuilding of the temple there. So, mm. Well, it, it's probably more figurative, too. Right, where it's like they will be in abundance and wealthy and happy. Yeah, sure. That 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 would make sense, but also uh like they referenced there in Revelation, like mm-hmm. it was, you know it's a uh that's that's the ideal version of heaven yeah, work of and progress. earth. Gotcha. Like it's um because that that's what, you know, uh apocalypticists were would have been waiting for is a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, so yeah, I mean, gold of Ophir, we've, that's popped up in the Bible multiple times. A classic place to go for gold. If you want your gold, go to Ophir, uh, classic stuff. Hey, so if you're enjoying the stream so far, give us a like and share it and celebrate it. Sing songs of praise to it. Yeah. Just like, uh, just like Tobit did. Yep. Now we're about to get into... The final, the final chapter. chapter. So there's uh, some comments here. Um, At its end, the story returns to its uh, to its original calm. The epilogue reports the permanent state of prosperity of the characters and their final end, thus reinforcing the claim of the plot and the theory of retribution that God rewards charitable deeds. So I'm not going to read 
through all of the commentary at the end of this chapter here before we get into it, but sure. I will read some of it. So, just as Moses was privileged to give two testaments, Deuteronomy 31 through 32 and 33, so was Tobit, 4, 3 through 21, and 14, 3 through 11. But chapter 14 is more than a repeat of chapter 4, although it does conform more closely to the testament genre than does chapter 4. Uh, if anything, 14, 3 through 9, is even more a prose rendition of several motifs in Tobit's song in chapter 13. Um, so maybe a little on the nose is what we're about to get into. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so there's allusions to Genesis, Job, Deuteroisaiah, and... Uh, uh, whom, apparently. Yeah, and definitely Deuteronomy. Now, there's a long list of similarities with Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to read the verses, but I'll give you the list. Um, long life in the good land and prosperity dependent on fidelity, the offer of mercy after sin and judgment, rest and security in the land, the blessing of joy, fear and love to God, the command to bless and praise God, theology of remembering, centralization of the cult, and a final exhortation. Yeah, so quite a lot of ideas there. Yes. So there's some more commentary here, but I'm not going to get into it. Uh, Tobit's final words before dying, chapter 14. So sad. We've been with him for like a month now. Yeah. This has been okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, well. Next on to the funny thing, I guess. So ended Tobit's Thanksgiving. He died peacefully at the age of 112 and was buried in Nineveh with all honor. He was 58 years old when his eyes were injured, and when he recovered his sight, he lived quite comfortably. So there is a textual problem concerning Tobit's age uh, when he uh, yeah, when he lost his eyesight. Uh, that's 14, yeah, so 14.2. Uh, the Qumran text, so 4 q Tobit and I've, I'm not 100 percent sure on the, on the identifications here, but they're they're two separate manuscripts. Uh, along with the Old Latin and the Greek, indicate that he was 58 years old when he lost his eyesight. But then another Greek manuscript alone says that he was 62. Mm. There's some notes on this. Uh, so although not one of Israel's giants of longevity. Tobit lived right. longer than Judith or Joseph and Joshua, uh, but less than Moses and far less than Job, who lived 140 years after his possessions were restored. Mm. Originally, Tobit's age was given in 4Q Tobit, but it has not survived. Uh, they say on the basis of the old Latin that there's a conjectural reading that gotcha. supports the age, but... It's conjectural. So, uh, he gave alms and continued to fear the Lord God and to acknowledge the majesty of God. Just before he died, he summoned his son Tobiah and his seven sons and gave them these instructions. My son, take your children and flee to Media, for I believe God's word spoken against Nineveh by Nahum will come true and will happen to Assyria and Nineveh. Yeah, so uh, Tobit cites Nahum, a 7th century... We will get to the book later on, obviously. Uh, he, so he cites Nahum, a 7th century prophet whose whole work consists of rejoicing over the fall of Nineveh in 612 BCE. Uh, the Greek recension, uh, G1 reads Jonah instead of Nahum. Jonah is a fictional work about a prophet who is sent by God to Nineveh. When, after some resistance to God's call, he finally goes to Nineveh, his words are instrumental in converting the whole city. God, who had intended to punish the Ninevites, instead forgives them, much to Jonah's uh, chagrin. Tobit's whole message uh, is changed if one reads Jonah instead of Nahum. Tobiah would have no need to leave Nineveh. All its citizens would turn to God, and God would turn to them in blessing instead of destruction. So this is longer on the Codex Sinaiticus, which says, Go to Media, my child, for I fully believe that which the prophet Jonah spoke against Nineveh, that it will be overthrown, but in Media there will be peace for a time. 
Our kinsmen will be scattered over the earth from the good land. Jerusalem will be desolate, and the temple in it will be burnt to the ground and will be desolate for a time. So, okay, that exists. Uh, so, uh, he's giving instructions to his sons. He says, Indeed, all that was spoken by the prophets of Israel, whom God sent, will occur. And nothing from all their words will fall short. Everything will be fulfilled in their appointed times. So you will be safer in Media than in Assyria and Babylonia. For I know, and I am convinced, that everything that God has said will happen. It will come true, and not a single word of these prophecies will fail. And your kinsmen who live in the land of Israel will be scattered and taken captive from the good land. The entire land of Israel will be desolate. Even Samaria and Jerusalem will be desolate. And the temple will be burnt to the ground and for a time will be in mourning. So what I read prior is the shortened version of all that, Mm -hmm. which occurs in G1. Um, But God will again have mercy on them. God will bring them back to the land of Israel. They will rebuild the temple, although not like the first one, until the era when the appointed times shall be completed. Afterward, all of them will return from their exile and will rebuild Jerusalem in her splendor, and the temple will be rebuilt within her, just as the prophets of Israel spoke concerning her. Then, all the nations... To be fair, they also spoke, this place is fucked. Yeah, yeah, they did. (laughs) Then all the nations in the entire world will all be converted and will worship God in sincerity. They will abandon their idols, which have deceitfully led them into error, and in righteousness they will bless the eternal God. All the Israelites who are spared in those days and are truly loyal to God will be brought together and will come to Jerusalem. Therefore... They will live securely in the land of Abraham, which was given, which will be given to them. Those who truly love God will rejoice, but those who commit sin and wickedness will vanish from the whole earth. Wow, that's uh, that's quite the claim. But that goes along with the whole new heaven, new earth thing, doesn't it? Yeah, and the new yep. Jerusalem. Yeah. So, so it's not only a new Jerusalem; it's a n- whole new planet. It's a whole new world. Yes. Uh, so this is Pocahontas or something. What? That's not in Pocahontas. Oh. <laughs> That's in Aladdin. Ah, oh, thanks. There you go. Uh, but also, you could uh, play it off by the um, the Johto theme song. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Uh, so gotta get to the top of that hill. Yeah. <laughs> Similar hopes are expressed in Isaiah two two through three and First Enoch. In 1021, quote, all the children of the people will become righteous and all nations shall worship and bless me and they will prostrate themselves to me. Um, so there's that. Um, and now, my children, I give you this command. Serve God faithfully and do what is pleasing in his sight. Train your children to do what is right and to give alms, to be mindful of God and at every opportunity to bless his name with sincerity and with all their strength. Now, as for you, my son, leave Nineveh and don't stay here. On the day you bury your mother next to me, do not stay even overnight within the city's borders, for I perceive that there is much wickedness within it and much treachery done there. Yet they are not ashamed. No, much treachery. I don't like much treachery. It's like Sodom. (laughs) Consider, my son, what Nadin did to Ahikar, who raised him. Was he not forced to go underground, even though he was alive? Yet God reversed the disgrace done against him, with the result that Ahikar came out into the light, while Nadin went down into the eternal darkness for his attempts to kill Ahikar. So we're returning both to the Ahikar story and to that theme of light and darkness that occurs throughout. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got nothing on that. Actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, because Ahikar gave alms, he escaped the deadly trap that Nadin had set for him. And it was Nadin who fell into the deadly trap, and it destroyed him. So now, my children, you see what almsgiving accomplishes and what wickedness does. It kills. But now my strength is failing me. 
They then laid him on his bed. He died and was honorably buried. Ah, good. So now we're getting into the final section here, just the last three verses. Yeah, so uh, Tobit, uh, who had risked everything to give honorable burial to others, is himself buried with honor. Mm -hmm. Good. He deserves it. He's a good man. So I want to see if there is a thing on the Ahikar story in the commentary here. Oh, I'm I'm sure there is. So uh, I'm going back to the Ahakar story in, in here because they cover it as well. Okay, so, so, uh, so when he was forced to go underground, um, he brought down into the earth. This is an allusion to the incident in the tale of Ahikar where the condemned sage went into hiding, the Syriac version saying, quote, and Nabusemak rose up and Eshfagni, my wife, and they made for me a hiding place underground under the threshold of the door of my house. Uh, and Ahikar coming into the light is both true literally and figuratively. It parallels with Tobit's experiences because it goes from not being able to see to being able to see. So anything to add on that? Well, uh... I mean, you did hit on the important part mm -hmm. of the story of Ahikar. Uh, if you want me to go a little bit more on the story itself, we're not going to you know, cover the whole thing here. Yeah. Um, but uh, the narrative tells the story of the life of Ahikar, a royal official at the courts of Sennacherib and Asaradon. Uh, because he's childish, Ahikar adopts Nadine, his nephew, and trains him to succeed uh, to his royal. P yeah, to uh, succeed to his royal position. But Nadine, treacherous and ungrateful, accuses Ahikar of his disloyalty to the king. Uh, and then it goes on from there. All right. So let's hop into these last few verses. So when Tobiah's mother died, he buried her next to his father. He, with his wife and his sons, then moved to Media, where he lived in Ekbatana with his father-in-law, Raguel. Classic place to live. Yep. He lovingly cared for his parents-in-law, and buried them in Ekbatana of Media. Then he inherited the estate of Ragwell, as well as that of his father, Tobit. He died highly respected at the age of 117 years. So, still not as old as Moses. But yeah. Older than his dad. Yeah, older than his dad. Uh, Tobiah's life also testifies to the validity of the theory of retribution, uh, like his father, he is a just man. He lives a long life, dying at the age of 117. Five he, years longer than his father. Yeah. He is also prosperous, having inherited the estates of both Tobit and Raguel, and he has a full number of descendants. Seven sons. Full number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before he died, he heard of the destruction of Nineveh. Okay, so... Living in Ekbatana, Tobiah could not have seen Nineveh's destruction. Right. Um, so in the final verses of the Vulgate, there's no mention of the fall of Nineveh or those responsible for it. Uh, continuing with the verse. Um, so he heard of the destruction of Nineveh, and he saw its prisoners. Those who whom King Syaxares of Media captured being led away to Media. So King Syaxer is of Media. So there's uh, there's quite a bit of stuff that I can uh, get into here. So the final verse of the book announces the destruction of Nineveh. Uh, Alter describes one of the functions of narration as providing a chronicle of public events and context of meaning. The chronicle of public events is minimal in Tobit, occurring only in chapters 1 and 14. The title of the book situates the beginning of the story in the reign of Shalmaneser. The succession of Assyrian kings is briefly and incorrectly noted, and a few pertinent events during each reign are mentioned. The story of Tobit's early days is woven into, the brief into this brief chronicle. Uh, from the last mention of the reign of Asaradon in 2.1 until this final chapter, the book is silent concerning public events in Assyria. In chapter 14, the fall of Nineveh to Syaxerxes, or uh, Syaxares, I don't know, uh, 
King of Media is reported. This public event is also woven into the lives of Tobit and Tobiah. Tobit predicts Nineveh's fall, relying on the prophet's word. Tobiah, having heeded the warning and left Nineveh, rejoices over its fall. The chronicle of events does not supply uh, does not simply provide a historical backdrop for the story of Tobit. It also provides a subtle context for interpretation. Assyria, personified in its kings, was wicked. These kings were responsible for the exile, suffering, and death of many of God's people. Tobit is an example of those who suffered under their rule. His virtue grew under the distress they caused. But as his life, as his life witnesses to the truth that God rewards the righteous, the fate of Nineveh testifies that God punishes the wicked. For this reason, Tobiah rejoices. The narrative economy is striking. Nineveh and its rulers appear only at the beginning and end of the story, but even this subtle reference to the wicked city and its fall provides an effective contrast to the story of the just man set in the midst. And on the name of the conqueror, uh, so the name of the conqueror of Nineveh is confused in the various traditions. So uh, Greek 2 and the Old Latin seem to be reading the name Ahikar, and uh, Greek 1 reads Nebuchadnezzar and Ahasuerus. In fact, Nineveh fell to Nebopolassar of Babylon and Syaxarxes of Media in 612 BCE. There's a pretty cool list of kings with dates in the ah, back here. That's nice. Which we can reference that some other day. But um, I do want to note about this name, Syaxarxes. So this name appears in none of the ancient manuscripts. On the other hand, none of the king's mentions appeared to be original either. We know of no Median king named Ahikar, nor was there a Median king named Nebuchadnezzar, although the Babylonian king, Nabopolassar, 626-605 BCE, father of Nebuchadnezzar II, is credited along with Syaxers of Media, uh, with destroying Nineveh in 612 BCE. G1 mentions Ahasuerus as the co-destroyer of Nineveh. The book of Esther features an Achaemenian king by the name of Ahasuerus. But he is Was that Esther? Yeah. yeah. Oh shit. All right. It's in the Greek text. Forgot about that. Uh, oh, that's right cuz we read that we read from that too, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. But he's regularly identified with Xerxes the 1st. And ah, yeah, that's right. Okay, yes, because I think one of the translations we were using Xerxes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ezra 4 5 through 6 is historically accurate in having Ahasuerus Xerxes reigning between the Achaemenian kings Darius, uh, the first Histapes, Histaspes, and Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes, yeah. Um, it by contrast. Daniel 9.1 has an Ahasuerus as the father of Darius the Mede, although the latter is probably an invention of the author of Daniel 9. Uh, Tori thought that in some way Ahasuerus represented Syaxeres. Obviously much thought and ingenuity, but little success have attended scholarly efforts to explain the various corruptions of the original name. So let's... It's a tough call on that one. Yeah. So let's finish this... Uh, this last verse. So King Syaxeres of Media captured, being led away to Media. Tobiah blessed God for all that he had inflicted on the Ninevites and the Assyrians. Before dying, he rejoiced over Nineveh, and he blessed the Lord God forever and ever. Amen. It literally ends with amen. Amen, everybody. Amen. So he makes good on what Raphael told him to do. Yeah, that was pretty much the whole story, wasn't it? Yeah. Him making good on what Raphael is telling him to do. Yep. Uh, so what did you think of Tobit? Well. I'm going to miss Tobit a bit. It's more of like a hero's journey than most of the stories. And that's that exactly why see. I'm going to miss it, because it followed a story structure and like had arcs and mm. like character building and... It was okay. It was a real story as opposed to something that was like, 
oh, here's some stuff that happened, and then some God God says more things than than anyone else. Absolutely. Um, also, it uh, you know this one because of its length, you know, you, you kind of have to bypass character development. Mm. Uh, but you know, the story is it was easy to follow. Uh, and and it's not bloated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was wasn't bad. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh. I still want to know more about the dog. Yeah. <laughs> Not too bad. You'd have to know the original story this stole that part from. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, an animal dog. companion is pretty common. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, like, I want to know it's his name and stuff. His name was Dog. Ah, ah, classic dog name. Dog meat. Good boy. Yeah. So, I don't know. Tobit, it's a decent story. I'm not sure that there's a lot of like major theological import. The the angel stuff at the end there was kind of neat. Yeah, the angel stuff right at the end was pretty neat. Um, and the Raphael stuff in general, it's cool to see an archangel doing things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I liked having, I guess, a, a a piece of God of if not God as an extension as a character who yeah. wasn't just that omnipotent jerk. <laughs> I yeah see I would I would say that you know uh angels in general are just extensions of god. Yeah, well, I think that when we get into books like Jubilees and Tobit that the angelology is much yeah. more developed. Like you compare that to like the stuff in the Pentateuch. Yeah. No comparison. Yeah. Yeah. But And then oh and then first Enoch also. Yeah, oh man. Yeah, it gets uh, gets kind of crazy. Certainly, first Enoch. That's yeah. like all about angels and yeah. shit. But uh, I mean, good book. I uh, I might be interested in checking out the Ahikar story at some point. To yeah, see definitely. How close it actually reads to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I I don't have that much to say about it. The prayer at the end that he does is interesting. It's it's a uh, kind of strange. How, like, it's almost as if the whole story is uh, setting the stage for the deliverance of a certain prayer that uh, pretends to predict the return from exile. Yeah, and I would say that uh, the formation of the prayer was... uh, I don't know, the the thing is the, the prayer isn't really, you know, super exciting, right? It's a prayer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that there might be some interesting topics we could, like, or maybe I could delve into in the future on the textual history of that because it did seem, it just seemed off to me. Let's just uh, let's just say that. But you know what isn't off to me? What? The alphabet of Ben Sira. It makes perfect sense. And we will be discussing it next week. Uh, Since nobody seems to make any commentary on it, yeah, will yeah. be the commentary. We Mostly are me. the commentary. I'll, I'll, uh, you know, read over some papers and get some, get some material to talk about when we discuss the book. And that'll be next time because we won't have anything this Sunday. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's right. definitely tune in next Friday for our our alphabet reading. Now, did we get anyone who said that they would come on for the uh, alphabet? Uh, I'm going to hit up, uh, David Skelton one more time. Uh, the person he recommended did not respond. Mm. Uh, try Pit Monk? What? Did you try Pit Monk? Oh, we could try Pimp, yeah. He'd uh, love uh, it. He would love it, but I don't know if he'd have access to it. I have to find one online. Uh, yeah. I'm sure there's a PDF floating around Good somewhere. luck with that. Yeah. You know how, tr- you know how hard I try to find one? No, but we believe that you probably tried hard. Did yeah, you lo- use there's a reason I got a book. Library Genesis. I don't remember if I did try that. Uh, but either way, either way, Genesis. I'll you know. I'm officially endorsing Library Genesis uh-huh. as a good website. If you say so. Uh, but yeah, the book is absolutely ridiculous. It is a medieval Jewish parody <laughs> of, uh, well, I, I would say it's probably of the beliefs at the time or something or maybe it was just like i i don't know i'd have to read up more on it but it was a parody well people had a sense of humor even back then this is proof yes oh my god people with a sense of humor that's crazy oh and just in case anybody's worrying oh uh, right i'm not drinking like nothing sewage uh this is just green 
<laughs> Same kind of green. Really light green. Yeah. yeah. Lawrence, you got one too. Show I up. do. I have I have two actually. For wow. Whatever reason, I'm really bad at finishing these. Uh, but yeah, there's that. So so, <laughs> you got any final thoughts on Tobit? Uh, no, no. I think we uh, we covered it all. All right. Well, if that's all, then maybe our viewers can check out our Amazon wish list where there's tons of books that we can add to this table and continue producing quality edutainment for all of you. And uh, if you want to support us in a different way, we got a 666 donation drive going on right now. Yeah, you can support uh, Baal, who has uh, fallen over. Yes, it, just like in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, just like in the Bible. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. It's Incredible. bound to happen. Uh, so once we hit $666 in donations, we'll be getting a Thetan meter. We'll be taking it apart. We'll see who the most clear is. We'll see how we can manipulate it. And we'll tell you a bit about Scientology. Um, otherwise, you can check out our Patreon. We got lots of cool stuff on Patreon. You could You can be entered into t-shirt giveaways every single week. Sorry, now week. Holy crap. No, every month. First yeah. of every month. First show of every month. <coughs> yeah. Otherwise, we would like supply Landon's entire. <laughs> He'd just wear our shirts exclusively. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's all he would have. That's all he would be able to find. <laughs> hey, maybe he would have enough to like give to everyone next time he goes to Antarctica. Maybe. Right. Though I don't know how much short sleeve t shirts will help them. Probably not much in Antarctica. Yep. It's a very cold Check place. Out our soon to come Antarctica edition. <laughs> <laughs> At least accommodates a little because it's not that. Like I'm hoping that we can be the most popular show in Antarctica. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um oh yeah, if you want to be on the show, fifty bucks a month, you can come on, you can uh read with us, provide commentary. Tell us all about your interpretations of certain biblical narratives. Um, we don't only allow atheists on the show. If you're a That's believer, accurate. you can pay us money. Or uh, if you're Steve, you can be an agnostic. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Or if you're Steve, you could be an agnostic. <laughs> we invite you on then too. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Oops. I don't know if you uh, if you just want to buy t-shirts. Yeah, we got lots of lots of t-shirts. There's a new uh ish drive 6661 uh with the B holding it. Mm, uh yeah. plenty of behold shirts. That, Our mascot. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It's nice having a mascot. <laughs> it's something else, you man. You make an animation with it with it in it somehow. That's a good idea. That'd be nice. Yeah, a bee flying out of the the diamond thing. Oh, not bad. Wow. Not bad. All right. Well, with that being said, I guess we'll we see, see you on Friday. Friday. Yeah. Not Sunday. Not Sunday. Next, we don't have a thing going on here this Sunday. Sunday. We'll see you Friday. And Bye. then the Sunday thereafter. Yes. Uh,